Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. Today, we are so happy to have Dr. Kim Fisher on the podcast. She is a board certified physician, anesthesiologist, and the founder of Lucid, an advanced care planning coaching service. She has practiced medicine for over 10 years and supported countless families through difficult conversations and decisions regarding advanced care planning issues. Are you clear on what you want to happen should an accident or illness arise that renders you unable to speak for yourself in the hospital? Have you ever had to make the decision for someone else to have a procedure that could lead to their death? Did your family have conflict around one of those topics? Have you talked to the important people in your life about what you want to happen if you can no longer make medical decisions for yourself? Do your loved ones know what your wishes are? If not, you will want to listen to Dr. Fisher explain all this to us. Welcome, Dr. Fisher, to the podcast. Wow, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you, and it's such an interesting topic. Uh, please tell us about your work as an advanced care planning coach. What is an advanced care planning coach, first of all? And being an anesthesiologist, what inspired you to get into this line of work? Sure. So I'll tell you, a couple of days ago, I was called into the operating room. Uh, there was an emergency happening, and I was one of the on-call anesthesiologists. And everyone was setting up for this really big surgery that was about to happen. And you've got all the noise of all the different doctors and nurses and scrub techs, and there's a lot of energy. And I walked up to the surgeon and I said, has anyone talked to this patient's family? Have we talked about what this patient would want? Because unfortunately this patient was coming in for a procedure and he wasn't very coherent at this point and able to talk with us. Sure. And the surgeon said, well, I, I kind of heard maybe someone said he, they'd want everything done. I said, okay, so we haven't talked to the family yet. We don't know what they want. Um, so I, as they're kind of wheeling the patient in, I said to my colleagues, don't do anything that can't be reversed. Let's just slowly get monitors on. I got his children on the phone and I had his son and two daughters. We had three cell phones and I, you know, introduced myself. I explained what was going on and I asked them, what, what would your father want? What, what is important to him? How does he want to live? And all three of them were so clear that their father would never want another procedure. He had actually had this kind of procedure in the past. It's one that actually has a really high morbidity and mortality rate, this particular procedure. And it's one that a lot of people don't do well with. Sure. And their father was so clear and said, or excuse me, the son was so clear and said, no, dad has told us over and over again, he would never want another surgery. And so thankfully that's, we did what exactly the patient would have wanted because the children knew. So we got the patient upstairs and we had the family around them and we supported them um, with their, their next decisions. And, and I was, share that. It, and that was only because you got on the phone and did that proactively. It was, it a hundred percent was. And also the other important piece of that is that that family had had conversations around how their father wanted to live, what was meaningful to them, um, what kind of life did he, how did he define life, right? right? What right. was he not willing to tolerate? And right. so as an advanced care planning coach, that is actually the kind of conversation that I facilitate for people so that in these moments, they're ready to speak for their loved ones. So quality of life discussion or definition is very important. Uh, but what other discussion elements need to take place to remove uh, any ambigu ambiguities? Like uh, what, what is uh, meaningful? I mean, you, you really have to know uh, what kind of life does this person want, right? Yeah, and honestly, meaningful is different for all of us, right? What I define right. as meaningful is very different than what you define. And also it's going to change as our life circumstances change and as we get older. Uh, 
I will share another story with you. I don't know if you've read Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. Uh, he shares in there a story about actually one of his colleagues. Um, his colleague's father was having a procedure and she realized, oh my God, I'm his healthcare proxy. I've never really gone in and asked him what is a meaningful life to him. Right. And so the night before a big procedure, she went in and she, she said, dad, what matters? What matters in how you live? And he really surprised her. And he said, I define a meaningful life by my ability to watch football and eat ice cream. If I can watch football and eat ice cream, we're good. And so that for him was how he defined meaning, right? I've had another client that um, recently said to me, as long as I can come to the dinner table and tell a joke and the joke's still funny, that's, that right, to me is a good right. quality of life, right? We're not talking about interventions because we never know the interventions that are going to possibly need to happen. But what we can do is hold up this filter to any treatment options and say, okay, my dad said it's got to be the ice cream and the football. Will this treatment allow for that? Then that treatment likely makes sense. Can you give us some examples of situations people have brought up to you as to what they would not want to tolerate. Yeah, yeah. So I actually try to really get clear on that exact question. And I start asking questions like, would you be willing to tolerate being alive if you had to have machines keep you alive 24 hours a day? And then I try to explain that when machines keep us alive, most of the time, that means we're not in our home or in a home, we're in more of a, what we call like a long-term care facility, right? That might mean that we're bed bound. That might mean that we are unable to take care of ourselves, um, that we rely on 24 24- hours. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technical <laughs> difficulties that we rely on 24 hour care, meaning someone to take care of us because all those machines need to be maintained. So I ask people specifically if those are things they'd be willing to tolerate. And again, I think it's different for everyone. For some people, they feel that, yes, no matter what, I would like that. And for other people, they see that as suffering. And that's not what they would want. Right. I, I, I could see somebody saying, well, I want to I want to walk three miles a day. If I can't walk three miles a day, I'm sure you probably run into that kind of thing, situation. Yes, I want to be able to be moving and to be mobile. Or people also say, you know, life's not worth living to me if my cognition isn't here. Meaning that, you know, if an accident happens and all of a sudden I don't have my ability to like recognize or be with family or, or understand who I am in the world, that's not how I want to live. And again, that's very individualized. And I think, um, even when we have a spouse that we love and sleep next to for years, we still don't necessarily know the answer to these questions until we ask them. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how different does this conversation become uh, between the time somebody is well and somebody's, uh, say, faced with the possibility of death? I think it's a really important point that you bring up. Um, Really what you're asking is how does the conversation change when someone's in a state of health versus mm -hmm. has a real serious illness diagnosis? And I think it is a very different conversation because with the illness, you can kind of look and know a little bit more about the trajectory and have a conversation that's based on kind of the disease process and what that person would want. I really like to talk to people actually in a state of health, right? Before something like that has happened. Absolutely. Uh, it's less stressful, right? Again, do we know what we always wait, may want? No, but it starts that conversation. So if we do get a serious illness diagnosis and we need to revisit this, we actually already have language for having this conversation. We've, we've talked about death and dying because we never know when it's going to happen, but it is actually going to happen to all of us. Yes, it is. Is it a good idea to record these conversations? I'm so glad you asked that. I videotape and record all of these conversations. Okay. I think it's a great idea. Uh, there's a number of reasons why. I think in a moment of stress, which tends to be when you need to 
now stand up and speak for your loved ones. You may not remember everything from the conversation. You may want to clarify what you've heard your loved ones say. You may have um, other people in the family that disagree and maybe don't believe that uh, the person you're speaking for said certain things and you can go back to that video. So I do encourage people to A, start this conversation as soon as possible, videotape it. And when we revisit, you know, ideally annually or when something major happens, we re-record so that it's not just a document that's shoved into a safe somewhere and maybe someone has that code maybe deep in an email. It's a living document is what it is. It really exactly. Is. And yeah. really those documents that were created, they were created to document a conversation. And unfortunately, what I have seen, you know, you asked me this a while ago and I, I didn't quite answer what I've seen in my work as an anesthesiologist is that I think people are very well intentioned when they fill out traditional advanced directives, but they, you know, fill it out. It's a menu of options. They don't truly understand. They put it in a safe, no one sees it and no one's ever talked about it. And so now someone's looking at this document and saying, what did they mean? Huh? Yeah, I don't right. understand. It's not spelled out. It's not spelled out. And that's where I really recognize, well, we can do this before we're in the hospital. When we have time, when we have over an hour, when we're not rushed in a doctor's visit, um, right. when it's really, you know, something calm. So Dr. Fisher, what is, a, what is a good age to start the process of having an advanced care directive? What, what would be a good age to do this? I think the right age, at least to start these conversations, is when you're an adult, because, you know, we've kind of all think of those stories that we have seen in the news of young adults who are completely healthy, right? And a tragic accident happens. And now the family needs to make decisions. And if we're able to kind of sit back and again, think about, hey, what gives my life meaning? What's, what am I willing to tolerate to your question? What am I not willing to tolerate and have that conversation? Then uh, the care that we receive, if we ever need it, is hopefully a lot more in line with what we would want. And people aren't less left guessing, you know, yeah. what, what would she want? So right. really the answer is now. Um, you know, I did recently have a consultation with a 90 year old who was lovely, who said to me, I think it might be time. Yeah. I think I might, I might, <laughs> it might be time to consider my, my end of life decisions. And I laughed and I said, well, my husband and I talk about it. We go hiking and I tell him, oh, okay, I want to party. And this is what I want there. I want to become soil. And she said, wow, you're talking about that at 40. I said, yeah, because you know, you never know what's going to happen, but I did love, she's like, I think I'm 90 now's time. Yeah, definitely. What questions do the health surrogates uh, need to ask the medical community about the procedures or the surgery involved as to the quality of life resulting from it? In other words, uh, you go in there with your loved one, they're talking about surgery. What, what kind of questions does that surrogate need to, need to ask that, that doctor, that physician or, or whoever? It's be such that. an important, that's such an important question because just because we can do something does not mean we should. And unfortunately, we have to think about the outcomes of everything that we do. So I actually think I would bring it back to that, that idea of that, that uh, person that wanted to eat ice cream and, and watch football. That's what gave him meaning. And right. so the question then becomes to the physicians, if we do this treatment, if we do this surgery, is dad going to be able to do that? Is he going to be able to eat ice cream and, and watch football? And if the answer is yes, then yeah, great. But if the answer is no, then it's okay. So this isn't the treatment. What are our other options? Right. Because what you're really getting to is that the healthcare proxy needs to understand the outcomes and the potential outcomes of the surgery. And what they're really trying to do is say, is that outcome aligned with how my loved one would want to live. Right? Yeah. That first example also that I gave you about that, that patient who didn't want to have the surgery, the big reason he didn't want to have the surgery is he knew that he would potentially be in an ICU for weeks on end and, and would probably die there. And that was not how he wanted to die, right? And so that's why that family really understood this is not the right surgery. So it's right. going back to that conversation that you've had with your family and saying, this is what my loved one has said. Is this treatment in line with these wishes? Right. 
what healthcare providers are trained in advanced care planning in the medical community? Mm, it's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, honestly, primary care physicians are trained to be able to have these conversations. Um, I think, unfortunately, that to have a really good conversation about how you want to live, both now and at the end of life, you need a lot of time. And 15 minutes in a visit, or even 30 minutes, just may not be enough time to have that conversation. And a lot of times when we go to the doctor, we don't necessarily bring our healthcare proxy with us. They may be in another state. And so now a beautiful conversation may have been had between a physician and their patient, which is a great thing to happen. But the step that didn't happen is that conversation wasn't also had with the healthcare proxy. And that's the problem is that healthcare proxy is gonna be called on to speak for their loved one and perhaps they've never spoken. But truly, I do think all physicians are qualified to do it. What I will say is that I think we in medical school have also really, it was a disservice that we were not taught enough about how to talk about death and how to talk about grief and how to explain to families that sometimes death is an option and it's an okay option. And it doesn't mean that we failed, right? There's I think in our training, we were taught so much, you must keep everyone alive. If you haven't, you've failed. And that's not necessarily the case. We have incredible technology now, but the question is, is that what the patient would want? They right. might be suffering. Right. Um, so long, and, long answer to your question. Right. And not all, uh, not all in the medical community are the greatest communicators, to be quite honest. I think you're hundred percent correct about that. I think that, you know, mm -hmm. that's also not a part of our training, right? We're not trained to be facilitators and communicators. And so it's really building those skills on your own. Yeah. Obviously palliative care physicians are incredible at this geriatricians, but sure. they're given that extra training yeah. um, to have these conversations. And it's even, even I recently was in a meeting with a group of other anesthesiologists and we were speaking about a patient that did unfortunately die not during surgery at a different point. And I was fascinated with all the euphemisms for death that were used during that conference. No one said the word die. Everyone said they passed, um, they expired. No <laughs> one could say the word they died. That's, and it was fascinating to me. Here you have a group of physicians that have been practicing for years and years and years, and we still can't use the word death. Kind of like a taboo word, huh? It, it, well, I don't believe it is. It happens to all of us, right? Yeah, and so right, I'm right. I, I, I mean, think I'm a, a taboo of, word for them. Is for what I for mean. them, yeah. I mean, yeah. people look at me like I'm crazy, but uh, I personally feel like no, this is a part of life, and it's so important we talk about it. Absolutely. Now the directive to physicians, fam, uh, family, and surrogates were are uh, sometimes called a living will that they have to be made out in writing. Is that, is that something you can change? So it's really interesting that you asked that question. Right now, there's a huge debate within the medical community around, um, we call them living wills, advanced directives, and the research on them for the past 20 years and asking actually, are they doing what they've set out to do? So I'll just say that that is a conversation that's being had. Technically, yes, it's a legal document and a legal contract, and it does need to be notarized and signed. And so, yes, if you have filled one out in 1998 and you're now divorced from the person who you said was your health care proxy, technically that person still is. Uh, so that's another reason why I think it's really important to make sure that you've updated these documents. One other thing to think about, though, is that, you know, if you remember that story that I told you at the beginning where the family members really needed to quickly decide if surgery was appropriate, nobody had time to go and find said living will and really look up, what did dad say? Um, and so, you know, in some ways, that's why that document, it's a legal contract. And in, in healthcare, the conversation is so much more important and what the family members or your healthcare proxy understand about your wishes is so much more important. Now, Dr. Fisher, do you need a lawyer to fill out these forms to make them legal? I know you, you, you mentioned the notary, that kind of thing, uh, but do you actually need a lawyer to do this? 
So, and, and does it does it vary in, in different states? I guess would be another question. Sure. So the most important answer is no, you actually don't. So there are free resources on the internet that you can fill out who you want to be your healthcare proxy and they're state-based. And then you can also fill out a directive in order for them to be quote, legal binding contracts. You, that's where that notary comes in, but you do not need a lawyer to fill these out for you. Um, I do think what's super important, especially if you're someone that doesn't have a spouse and or child, and or maybe your spouse or child is not someone who you want to be your healthcare proxy, I definitely recommend at a minimum to fill out that healthcare proxy form so it's documented somewhere who you want to speak for you. I will say that some of the problems with those other advanced directives is that they ask questions like, at the end of life, do you want a breathing tube? Do you want dialysis? Do you want a feeding tube? And I honestly believe that those questions are just too difficult to answer. It's so esoteric. It's like if I went to uh, a um, if I went to a French restaurant. I don't speak French, and they gave me a menu, and I was supposed to order something, and I just had to randomly pick. I don't know what it means, and so I do think that that is the problem with those directives, and I also believe that lawyers are very well-meaning and intentioned, but I don't think they're able to explain to people what they're actually uh, checking off on those, on, those, on those documents. Okay. Can you explain to us what is uh, a medical power of attorney and is it needed if you have a medical directive in place? So I've been using the term healthcare proxy. And again, that's kind of state-based. Some people will use medical dur durable power of attorney. That is the most important thing you can do for yourself, really at the age of 18. That person is the person that the medical community is going to call if you can't speak for yourself. So that is the most important document to fill out. And again, it's called a healthcare proxy. It can be called, sometimes it's called a surrogate or an advocate. You can Google that for your state and easily fill out that document. That is separate from that living will that you were asking about. Sometimes a living will will include who your healthcare proxy is, but the medical durable um, power of attorney or your healthcare proxy, yeah. you want to document who that is, or at least, and also not only document, you want to tell that person. I've a few times been involved in patient care for a patient who can no longer speak for themselves and they you know, did fill out the form, which is lovely and, and state who they want to speak for them, who their medical durable power of attorney is, but they never told them. So now this person who never realized that they were gonna have to, to speak for their loved one or their friend is completely confused and is not prepared really no. to speak for them at They would all. be completely clueless. They would be completely clueless, but this happens all the time because I think we've become so focused on fill out the documents and put them away. Yeah. And and you're good, right? And I think people are well intentioned. And my point is, you know, I see it on the back end. I see when these things are really needed. And what matters is yes, definitely that you've appointed this healthcare proxy, but most importantly, that you've sat down and you've had a really good conversation with them and you've shared what your wishes are. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do doctors, nurses, hospitals, do they have to follow these directives? I mean, can they choose to ignore them? So there's always an ethics board if there's a lot of uh, question around the documents and dis treatment decisions or mm -hmm. families that are maybe saying, oh, that was filled out under duress. So that's when an ethics board would get together and um, I think help determine what is best for the patient. But in general, yes, they are followed. But again, remember half the time they're sitting in a safe somewhere, so we don't know. <laughs> so we're really going on, what does the family member know about their loved ones? What do they, do they remember conversations that they've had about how their loved one would want to to die, where they'd want to die, uh, yeah. what level of suffering are they willing to accept? So I think it would be a good thing for our audience to know if you have these 
forms filled out and you put them away in a safe, that's probably really not the best place to keep them. No, it's not. And, and also if you filled them out and you have not sat down and had this conversation with whomever is going to be your healthcare proxy, those forms really aren't serving you. So you really think you've done your planning and you're ready and you're trying to do your family a service, but it's not. A, a good friend recently reached out and said, I, my goodness, my mom told me she, she doesn't want to talk about this because she filled out the forms and she put them in a safe. And I said, oh, she is setting you and your siblings up for disaster, not right. purposely, but they have no idea what's written on them. And then kind of to back, going back to your question, again, a lot of times what's written on these forms is, is actually less than helpful, right? Someone might say, I never want to have a breathing tube, but what if the breathing tube is only needs to be there for, you know, what we call a trial of critical care. It only needs to be there for five days. Uh, that's why some of these forms sometimes can actually be really hurtful because yeah. they are saying, no, I'd never want a breathing tube. Well, tell me more. What does that mean? And that's why the conversation is so much more important. And that's why that filter of, well, is, is mom going to get back to being able to come to the dinner table and tell the jokes? Cause then the breathing tube's okay. But if she's never going to, then maybe it's not appropriate. Okay. I think you're kind of answering what my next question is. How do people come to make the decision to come to you to have these conversations? Because Obviously, you can have these conversations, but coming to somebody like you who has all this knowledge and has thought about all this and, and all these nuances, how do these people come to you to, uh, to, to make this decision? So what, drives, of, what drives them to you? Yeah. So uh, one of the first calls that I ever got was from someone who was looking at one of the documents, very well-intentioned, and she was sitting there and saying, I could not be more confused. I'm ready to plan. I want to fill this out. I want to cross it off my to-do list. And I'm staring at this document and I have no idea. Please explain it to me. Right. And so actually um, what I did was I had this great conversation between she and her son. We sat outside. It was about an hour and a half. And her son was able to answer all the questions, or excuse me, her son was able to hear all the answers to the questions. And she was able to really clarify everything. And she felt so much better because she realized Okay, she had done the planning, but also most importantly, her son understood what she wanted to have done. So I find that people tend to come to me when they're looking at these documents and saying, I'm feeling confused. It's also on their to-do list. It's on everyone's to-do list. It's just on the bottom, yeah. right? Everyone's like, oh, yeah. no, I got to have this conversation. <laughs> um, and so it's on the bottom of their to-do list. And I tend to find that people come to me when they've had something like a triggering event, Recently, someone came to me who her um, best friend's parents died in a car accident, and she saw some things happen with them that she was not comfortable with and felt like, ooh, this feels important. I need to have this conversation, and now's the time, right? So it's that triggering event of, oh, I need some help. It's almost like uh, planning, pre-planning your funeral. I mean, you, so, I mean you, if you have to do it, at the time of death, I, I would imagine that would be a lot harder than doing it when you're healthy. A hundred percent. And to be honest with you, that's a part of my service. So we definitely talk about the healthcare issues, but like, let's make it fun too. The last part of the, the process is how do you want to be celebrated? And yeah. recently um, I had a client and she uh, was telling us about the music that she envisioned at her funeral. And her children said, oh, mom, we know exactly what you want. It would be, it was some Jewish hymn. And the mom sat back and said, no, no, I actually want a different song. This is the song that I would want. So we had this beautiful exchange and a little bit of laughter and the kids right. got to really know this is what mom wants. And more importantly, mom got to say, okay, this is it. And I know exactly, they know what I want. Sure. And I'm sure they felt a lot more comfortable after that conversation and everything well, was determined. That's true. And I think that's also something we have a real fear about talking about death. And what yeah. I have found is that it's actually the most loving conversation yeah. and it surprises everyone because most of the time when I ask someone to say, hey, tell me what's most meaningful to you. Tell me what a good day looks like. Most of the time, that person is saying, oh, it's spending time with the people I love, including the person who's there as the healthcare proxy. 
So it's really reaffirming for the love that people have for one another. And I think it's also this really great check-in to be able to say, okay, I want to live intentionally. I want to die intentionally. I know what matters. Am I doing that right now? Am I living the way that you know I I want to? That's in aligned with my values. So it's kind of a good check-in too. Yeah, Dr. Fisher, how can people uh, contact you? So people can find me at my website. It's lucidadvocate.com. I have a conversation guide there. So if you're starting to think, okay, I know I need to have this conversation. I'm going to move it up my to-do list. I have a guide there for you just to make it easy. So you don't have to think about all the questions you need to ask. They're all right there. And if you feel like you need a little more support, I'm here, reach out to me and I'd love to help you. Okay, great. Uh, It's lucidadvocate.com. I will uh, put that in the podcast notes. I want to thank you, Dr. Fisher, for being on the podcast and bringing this important topic to the forefront today. Everyone is going to die sometime, but not everyone gets to choose how they are treated at the end of their lives. Taking the time to do advanced care planning and can help a family members and medical staff act for you. They will be faced with hard decisions near the time of your death. Having an advanced care plan lets you make sure that you are treated according to your values and wishes, regardless of whether you can speak for yourself. Comments and suggestions to improve the podcast. It's a wrap with rap at gmail.com is the email. Website is it's a wrap with rap.com. Our Facebook page and group. Our group is growing very fast. It's a wrap with rap. We're on Instagram. It's a wrap with rap podcast and all the episodes are on YouTube. It's a wrap with rap, the podcast uncut. Thanks everyone for listening. Please stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap.